So this might interest some people. What I have here is an Atmel AVR1 high-speed programmer. It's apparently like the cutting edge Atmel device at the moment. It's rather, really, it's kind of the most ridiculously overbuilt piece of equipment I've seen in a while. This is this giant, this is totally metal. It's got to be like a quarter of an inch thick. It, um, it's got this blue plastic border around it, and yes, it does in fact light up with the blue LEDs and look, you know, absolutely fabulous. It's got this, like, it's got this ridiculously dense, it's probably like 40 pin connector running out to the programming head, which actually then has, you know, an actual 5 pin connector on the bottom for these little programming dongles, and then here's your actual 6 pin plug for plugging into your actual target board. Um, it's also got this, which I believe is for their big 32-bit, you know, some of their ARM-based devices, and, a, you know, that's, there's a huge bundle of leads on that, too. That's probably like 30 pins, 40 pins. Got a big ground in the center. This is, it's high speed. Um, and then there's actually a bunch of logic in here. I'm not, I don't think I'm going to try and do much to that, just because it's plastic and snaps on that sort of thing break very easily, and I don't want to damage this because I kind of need it. But there's three, four, five, you know, five, six, seven, eight big ICs and at least as many, you know, small four or six pin, you know, three or six pin packages in here. I think there's, I think they're running differential pair out here actually. Because I know there's a big FPGA in here because when you update the firmware on here, it says updating FPGA image. So I'm mostly just going to take the lid off and look inside. It's... Um, actually, I mean, it's nicely built, but at the same time, you know, they've got this hugely dense ribbon cable just, like, poking out of a hole. And I would worry about cable fatigue. I mean, this isn't a very sharp, well, it's actually pretty sharp. You know, I would worry about, you know, this thing fatiguing, you know, over use. I mean, this is intended for, you know, developer usage, which means it's going to be, you know, reconnected and disconnected many times. The whole case only has these two big torques. Why do they every all why does everyone use torques? Two big torque screws on it. It says AVR one main unit FCC a whole boatload of symbol 12 volt DC at 1.25 amps and then it's got a power switch, you know, coaxial plug for power and USB. Oops. So I think that the bottom probably comes off. I'm not sure how this comes apart now. It only has screws on the back. Oh. Okay. So it's a slide lock mechanism. Who we take a look at that. So we have here. Here's the. There's this big rubber gripper here, and then there's another one at the bottom, and that squeezes the cable. At least it looks like it's designed so the cable's fairly easily replaceable. There's just a ribbon connector there. Here's this blue uh, plastic surround. It's got um, LEDs dotted around the exterior here and here and here and here. Those are presumably what light up the exterior. And then on here we just have really big Cyclone 2. This is SRAM, I would imagine, DC to DC, Cyclone, or, sorry, Cypress, CY7C, CY7C68001, so this, it's USB 2.0 high speed, and then there's a big Atmel device right there, 18 mega 128G? Um, either, I think it's an 18 mega 128280. And then we have a Cyclone EPCS 2C20 F484. So that's a 484 ball BGA device. It's a C8, which means it's a consumer speed. It's that's like the cheapest speed grade. It's only a C20, which means there's not a lot of logic elements in there. Um, so then this is. Almost definitely. Oh, that's another Atmel. That's an Atmel EEPROM. Uh, I wonder where the. I 
think that may be the FPGA configuration memory. Here's another Cypress part. It's a CY7C1019DV. Not sure what that is. Here's some big buffers from Fairchild. PK0AA or PKOAA FIN1180. And they're driving this cable, though I'm not sure that they're actually line drivers. Here's a whole bunch of interesting discretes and one little small BGA device. That may be programming voltage generation. It's interesting that they've got literally, you know, 8, 10, 11, 11 little SOT23 devices. That's interesting, that's probably coupling grounds together. 3.3 volts, 5 volts. Oh, look, it's got 12 volts on here, so this is... I wonder if that's a 5 volt LDO or something. Big diode, so it's reverse bias. It's reverse protected, which is cool. More DC to DCs. I bet that's like a... Huh. 2.5 volts, 1.2 volts. That's The FPGA needs a 1.2 volt, volt core and 2.5 volts to run a lot of its analog peripherals like the PLL, if I remember correctly. That's going to be JTAG. That's probably JTAG for this Cypress device, and I'm not sure what that is. There's presumably the programming header for this AT Mega. Let's see if there's anything on the other side of the board. It just sits in there, which is nice. Wow, totally bare except for bypass. You can see some pretty significant amount of care has gone into grounding. You've, I see three separate ground domains here, or at least power domains, perhaps. This is definitely at least four layers. It may, in fact, be six or even more. So Atmel Corp copy, right, 2006. This is not that recent, actually. I guess they haven't felt any need to change it. Um, that's about it. So this whole board just, it just sits in there, and actually you can see it's got gold per edges, and it looks like that's clamped against this heavy metal. Um, and then it's got some, it's got one alignment pin here, and it feels like there's another one over in the other corner. Oh yeah, it's right here. So there's two alignment pins that hold the board in precise place. The thing I really want to emphasize is how, like, I guess they were going for, like, really durable, but this is, it's either cast aluminum or cast pot metal. It feels heavy enough to be pot metal, but it's, you know, really, really solid. Like, massive overkill solid. And then these are the little latching devices, I guess. So they've got these plastic inserts and then they snap into this plastic insert and then there's I wonder what's up, oh yeah so this holds this connector so these little metal brackets I think keep this connector seated and then you can see the discoloration here from where this rubber gasket sits on it so it looks like there's these are these are DC to DC so these are your core voltage DC to DCs for the FPGA this is presumably 5 to 3 volts because or no, this is, so you get 12 volts in and then they go from 12 volts to plus 5 volts for running little doodly bobs, that might be the 18 mega. And then they go from 12 volts to 3.3 volts to run, um, presumably the FPGA peripherals. Or maybe they run everything off that except for maybe the Cypress device needs a 5 volt rail because it's talking on USB. But then I've seen USB devices that only run on 3.3, so I don't know. But I bet that's a little 5 volt LDO. There's some interesting decoupling here. So zoomed in as it goes. Um, EEPROM. It's just, it's just ridiculous how much stuff they stuffed on this board. Let's see how much is. There's a big TI device and TQF, or no, QFN. 8CC6JRK. There's a national semi device. <laughs> M87AX2743. That's a DC to DC controller from Fairchild. That one's also Fairchild. So these are the same converter. They're probably just resistor set. Um, this is, in fact, the same converter as well, though it's got a much bigger inductor. Um, I guess they size the inductors for the load. 
That, this section here just really interests me because of all of the SOT 23 devices. More line drivers. All of this ties into this big, uh, it's a 50 pin ribbon cable, 2 and 50. So it does look like one thing that is nice is that I think this is intended to be user replaceable, though not easily. I'm not going to disconnect it just because I want to avoid touching internals as much as possible. These are presumably blue LEDs. Kind of do the little, ooh, it lights up. And then here we have three, four status LEDs, and then this one's a bicolor. And then you can see you've got these light pipes that feed out of the case. So let me just get this in place. You see the light pipes sit right down on it. It's actually, all well, things very nicely engineered. I mean, it's yeah. very, I mean, they're obviously going very heavily for like a, a top shelf built to you know, resist a bomb kind of feeling. Which they've definitely pulled out pulled off just if nothing else, just by the ridiculous weight of the whole affair. The whole thing weighs like five pounds. More than that. And it's just one very big solid box. You know, it's kind of I wish they had come up with a way of making the uh the leads to the programming head feel more solid. But for what it's worth, you know, I've been using it and it works very well. I mean, I'm on Windows 7 x64 and I haven't really had any problems that aren't just me forgetting to plug the USB cable in, so they're doing something, right? It's just, you know, I guess they tend to think, you know, hey, it's our top of the line program, which would feel nicely. You know, and then it comes with a whole bunch of various, yeah, so that does come apart. So you've just got this, and that's, I wonder what the pitch on that is, maybe two millimeter, I think. Uh, oops, and I put the, and it just goes in. And they've done some careful work, you know, the connector on here, like, I don't know if you can see, but there's actually, oops, focus you. There it goes, there's a little plastic tab there, and that's designed so that this can only plug in one way. Like if you try to plug it in the other way, it hits the plastic tab and it won't plug in. So it's designed to be fairly easy to use. You know, I kind of, my one big complaint about this is that I kind of wish it would plug in like this. You know, but at the same time, you know, if you have your target board and you have this big long ribbon cable that comes out horizontally, it actually makes sense for it to plug in like this just because then the ribbon cable's already poking off your board. The only real issue is if you accidentally have to plug it in like that and then it becomes a pain in the butt. But I haven't had too much trouble. This on here says AVR1 probe, so you know what? So they call it a probe and it comes with a whole bunch of various kits and it actually has this special board that you plug into this connector and the bottom connector and it apparently does like some sort of timing calibration against the propagation time of the cable. And they call it calibration or something. It's been a few months since I calibrated this. Just when it turns out I was having some other incidental problems and was just trying to figure out. Yeah, that's making me uncomfortable. I don't really want to break the housing because I don't have another one. But it's a very nice, it's a very nice piece of kit. Lead free at mill. You can see there's let's see. You can see in here there's lots of little resistor arrays and whatever that is. A couple big devices. And one probe, and it's got AVR embossed on the cover very nicely. A really big cutout, which is kind of annoying actually. So they actually have one something with flying leads that plugs in here and then that little plastic tab acts as a keyway. A lot of other stuff like that. So it's very for what it is, it's a very refined, if just, you know, like, just like over-engineered by virtue of just using the biggest device they could find. You know, this is the, you know, the standoff, standoff adapter number three, 100 mil JTAG, 100 mil ISP. So anyways, that's the inside of an AVR-1 high-end Atmel programmer.